Quay, oops, hello, welcome. My name is Neil Silcox. I am the faculty excellence developer here at the Maple League of Universities. I am uh, coming to you today from unceded Mi'kma'ki, which is colonially, colonially called uh, Wolfville, Nova Scotia, Canada. I know we have a lot of people joining from all over the world today. So if you would love to pop in the chat and maybe tell us where you're coming from, I would love to see that. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to welcome you to uh, the special Maple League hosts session called The Joy of Teaching Physics, Music, and the Teaching of Joy. Maple League Hosts is an opportunity for us at the Maple League to bring in exciting people who excite us, um, luminary thinkers from around the world. And I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Raj Chowdhury. Dr. Chowdhury is the Executive Director of the Innovation and Learning Center at the University of South Alabama, as well as the President of the International Society for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. He also holds an academic appointment as Associate Professor of Physics, and Dr. Chowdhury is the founding director of the USA India Music Ensemble. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chowdhury. Take it away. Thank you, Neil. And uh, namaskar, namaskar everybody. Um, it's a great uh, privilege and an honor to be able to um, talk to you about two, two items in terms of my academic career that have been very, very close to my heart. So this is um, the first time I'm actually giving this talk when Neil and I were talking about me presenting to this particular group, um, kind of went back and forth about a number of things. And I'd met Neil at the last ISOTL meeting in Kelowna, and we got talking about our um, love of performance in, in very different kind of venues. And this kind of uh, led to uh, this discussion. So um, I hope to be able to take you on a journey. Um, Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, um, did say this, and so I've been I've been worrying about this the last few days as I've been finalizing my talk. Uh, I do know I think what I want to talk about, but um, um, I hope I can get everything done in the in the short time that we actually have with each other. Because being academics, like many of you, we know that um, it's it's very easy, right? At some point, when you're talking about something you're passionate about, to fill up an entire hour. And I do want to leave some opportunity for for a little bit of um, dialogue and discussion at the end. So where are we going um, with this particular journey? So if you'll allow me, I'd like to take you sort of on a, on really sort of my personal journey, um, navigating these two areas of um, physics and music that have been part of my life for the better part of, of many, many decades. And um, just in terms of things we'll, we'll touch upon, right? Um, uh, really sort of insights, autoethnography, in terms of thinking about my teaching, uh, my teaching in physics, my teaching in, in music. Um, obviously, in the back of my mind has always been also um, the scholarship of teaching, scholarship of teaching and learning, and then institutional structures, um, which have, um, have shaped kind of the way that I've gone about some of my work in this area. And then, um, you know, the... Um, I've always found I was in the classroom full time for about 15 years and I've been sort of out of it doing administrative work for um, the predominant of my job for the last about 15 years again. Um, but there's been real joy in that teaching. But I think both through my physics and music, I think there have been moments um, where there's actually been the opportunity to actually um, uh, teach about joy and about joy in our subjects and, and about our passion. And I hope to be able to share a couple of those with you as well. So I'm going to start in the realm of physics. Um, um, Fred Reif was a very well-known physicist who won the Millikan uh, Medal sort of from the American Association of Physics Teachers a long time ago. And I really love the way that he sort of formulates the instructional problem, right? So um, those of us in, in SOTL, of course, love to talk about um, the teaching problems that we work on. And so here's this graph of student development on the left-hand side, and then um, on the x-axis, time, right? And so students come to us in some initial state, S sub i, and they end up, right, in some final state, S sub f. And um, they take many different pathways of going there, right? But what you hope is that the ultimate slope is in that positive direction, and that when they end up, right, they have certain characteristics that are beyond what they just had when they came in. And so if we sort of put it into kind of physics terms, you know, the S sub J, so the generic state of a student, 
when they come in, right? Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, you know, what sort of knowledge, skills, belief, and attitude um, does a student have? Because we have entrance exams, we have all these kinds of um, entry criteria into our university settings. What we don't necessarily know how to do so well is to really um, gauge how do they think, right? Um, especially if you're gonna come into a faculty of physics, let's say, or a faculty of music, do they think like a physicist or, or what characteristics do they have in terms of thinking like a physicist or thinking like a musician, right? Um, and then the final state, right, uh, S sub F, and then all the accreditors require us to have these learning outcomes. Um, and so part of that pushes us to thinking about, you know, um, what should the student have when they leave us, right? And that leave us might be after one particular course of study over multiple years, it might be over a particular uh, term, a semester, a unit. Um, so those are things that you know we, we may even be able to articulate to some degree in our syllabi and in our program learning outcomes. But once once again, what's harder is you know how should they think, right? What does it mean to think like a physicist? What does it mean to think like a historian? What does it mean to think like a, a musician? So those are those are things that have been sort of in the back of my mind as I've been navigating this journey. So. Um, I was very fortunate in my time to actually spend some time with John Bransford. Uh, Bransford, uh, some of you may know as the author, one of the lead authors of the book, How People Learn, which was a, a report from the National Research Council here in the United States. And um, Bransford, um, to the end of his career, worked on this uh, large uh, research center called Life Center, Learning in Informal and Formal Environments. And um, I really love this graph for it. So you, you on the bottom axis, once again, it's time, right? Um, starting from, you know, essentially zero age, kindergarten in grades one through 12. So sort of formal schooling, undergraduate, graduate, all the way to retirement. And really thinking about the number of hours so out of the 16 waking hours, how much are you time are you spending in formal schooling? And then what are the other opportunities, right? And you'll see that the blue areas are much greater than the orange areas, right? So there's all these opportunities where we spend time in informal learning environments, um, which can in fact um, enrich in our lives in various ways. And in my particular case, I was able to take some of those um, lessons from the informal learning environment um, outside of formal schooling and apply them um, in, in very interesting ways. I've been very fortunate in that way to be able to apply it to my own work um, within academia. So um, if in, in my abstract, I talked about sort of my two journeys and, and I thought I'd just uh, of lining them up, right? So uh, when I was a K-12 student, this was in India. Um, I was also enrolled, you know, sort of after school in the Gita Bhitti Academy of Music. This was in Calcutta or Kolkata as, it, as we call it now. Um, and then, you know, after I came to the US one, to, to attend college, um, so I was 18 years old when I came, um, I sort of had to make this decision because I was young enough, like what part of my culture was I going to hold on to, right? Um, and how would I sort of maintain my identity as um, somebody who had this sort of Indian heritage? And so for me, it was very clear that it, it, I wanted it to be through music. And so um, I, I was very close to sort of getting a diploma from the Gita Bhitti Academy when I left to come to college. And so I, I knew some things and then starting through college, um, I, I started, my first offering was actually a non-credit music appreciation mini course in the middle of bit of money on the side, my college. And then had this great opportunity when I was a PhD student at University of California, Los Angeles to also be the vocal TA for uh, their ethnomusicology group, right? The Indian Music Performance Group. And then, you know, throughout my, my time as a physics faculty member, I mainly participated in, in sort of local Bengali community uh, group performances, leading them, shaping them, um, till um, in about 2007, this interesting opportunity came about where I was asked to take over um, at the small university in Virginia, the Christopher Newport University, the World Music Ensemble, right? And so I had this very, very unique teaching load of three classes of physics and one class of music, right? It's it's pretty, the, the department secretary in physics was like, Raj, there's something wrong with your teaching load for this semester. They're showing three physics classes and one music classes. What the heck is going on here? So then I had to explain that. No, that was actually, actually um, a real thing. And so that's kind of evolved to the point where 
um, you know, over the last 15 years as an educational developer. I then established uh, and founded at Auburn University in Alabama and now at University of South Alabama, Indian music ensembles sort of carrying on that tradition of the university-based world music ensemble. So I'm going to be jumping back and forth a little bit of between sort of the showing you some of some of the trajectory items and milestones that happened uh, throughout my teaching career, and then also um, you know things that that ground me and bring me back to really why I love this stuff. So um, this quote from Karl Popper I really liked, um, and this was really thinking about even my teaching of physics before I even got into teaching in teaching music was, you know, what amazes us, right? What really gets us excited about the things that we study? Um, and I wanted to have that same experience for my students, right? So how could I help orchestrate some of that? So um, in terms of my sort of uh, both teaching as well as my, my scholarship around the teaching of physics, I became really interested in visualization because uh, physicists as experts use lots of different visualizations to think about the world, right? And, and uh, moving through these visualizations is um, an important way um, that we think about the world, right? And so um, Joe Reddish, a phys physicist now retired from the University of Maryland, um, uh, presented this really nice work in his book, Teaching Physics, about all the different representations that we have, especially in science, that experts, so scientists, trained scientists and experts in the field um, move through without necessarily even thinking about them, right? And they become very facile at taking a symbolic a math equation, being able to create a graph out of that, right? Being able to take a bunch of numbers that come out of maybe a lab experiment and then be able to model that into something that might represent um, some sort of symbolic uh, expectation. And um, so I focused especially on thinking about, okay, so if we have, you know, a limited number of these representations, right, thinking about who my students were, could I help them decode and deconstruct, and then ultimately generate representations, because this is really what um, scientists do, and especially physical scientists do a lot of the time when we're studying the natural world. So I was teaching a physics class for non-science majors, right? So these are students who might be majoring in education, might be majoring in sociology, might be majoring music for that matter. And, um, you know, very early on in a, in a standard physics book, uh, book like this, you'll be talking about motion and typically motion under gravity, right? So I focused a lot of my work in my early uh, subtle work on this particular diagram, right? So this seems simple enough, right? Um, and then, but then as I started to look at it, right, and really think about, um, you know, my students, they were non-science majors, so they did not have a lot of mathematical sophistication. You know, were there things going on in this diagram that could actually help me help them think about physics in a more sophisticated way, right, while not necessarily having to go to mathematical formalisms to get them there? And so this really was my Carnegie Scholar project um, back, you know, uh, a couple of decades ago. And as I started to look at this diagram, right, and if you look at this, um, it's it's a little bit um, offset because so there's this baseball player and he throws a ball uh, vertically up into the air and it comes down. And um, of course, just for the, the sake of the representation here, we've offset the coming back down a little bit from the line of the, the ball actually flying up. Of course, in reality, the ball will go straight up, straight up and straight down in terms of what we're showing here. And you've got these nice little arrows, right? So we have the velocity arrows. So when it first leaves the, the player's hand, it's going rather fast. And then it sort of slows down under the pull of gravity. At the very top of the flight, the velocity is zero. So you got that V equals zero. And then as it comes back down, it speeds up again, right? So these, these red, uh, ve the velocity vector arrows are increasing and decreasing, sort of dictated by the pull of gravity. But then the blue arrows, little g, um, stay constant throughout, right? And there's a lot of work in the, in the physics literature about this misconception about students understanding the difference between sort of velocity and acceleration, that one is sort of the derivative of the other, right? And so if you actually start to think about this, there's actually calculus level mathematics embedded in this diagram, right? So my challenge then became that, okay, if you don't know the mathematical formalisms, can we still get to the essence of the physics, the underlying physics, through a visual representation, right? And um, what I was able to show is that 
for students who had the mathematical formulism, so physics majors or science engineering majors who understood calculus, it was no, no problem for them to interpret this diagram and may, be able to make that transference from the symbolic representation of the, of the physics into the graphical representation. But I was able to take students who didn't have a lot of math background and actually raise them up to that same level of understanding by really sort of um, decoding and then a reconstructing a diagram like this. So that was sort of a real win and a joy that I was able to bring um, this additional level of sophistication in terms of learning to students who didn't necessarily have the math background. Another thing that I mentioned in my abstract, and which will be sort of a, a, a theme throughout, is kind of the role of technology, right? So um, for, I guess, for about 20 years, I would have said that one of my research was really thinking about the affordances of emerging learning technologies, right, and the way that they would enable us to um, be able to teach physics um, in a more enjoyable way to a larger group of students than typically had, had access to. So some of you may actually remember things called CD-ROMs, right? Um, they were a big thing in, in educational technology once upon a time. We actually, I was actually fortunate enough to, to build, work on a team that built the very first physics education um, CD-ROM, right? This is um, almost 30 years ago. Um, it was called the Physics Info Mall. And then digital video came about, clickers, classroom response systems came about, more and more sophisticated computer simulations came about, right? Online homework systems came about, and all of these kind of enriched the way that I was able to get my students to engage with learning physics. All right, so we have a little chat activity. So since the the, the person on the left of this of this picture is uh, probably needs no introduction, so I just left his name up there. Could we pop into the chat if you know the name of the person on the right? So I'll pause for a second. So I got a couple of notes. Somebody comes up with Gandalf. Okay, that is a <laughs> um, appropriately funny um, response. Cool. And then um, we do have some people who probably have a little bit more of the, the, the South Asian background identifying um, this person as Rabindranath Tagore, right? So if you actually come to my office, um, the um, I actually have uh, two posters up in my office. One is a poster of Einstein, and then the other actually is a poster of Tagore, right? So this is these are probably people who um, embody kind of where I find myself at, at this intersection of physics and music. Uh, Rabindranath Tagore was the first Asian person to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. He won the Nobel Prize in Literature as, for his poetry in 1913. But then Tagore also um, wrote over 2,000 songs and um, basically gave rise to an entire genre of um, music um, called Rabindra Sangeet, or the, the music of, of Rabindranath. So he's, he's been a huge, this was the music that I was trained in, and has been a huge um, influence in my life. So I just wanted to share these two, because this is a great postcard I found years ago, and just for me, um, really embodies these two brilliant people who in their own ways were uh, world transforming, um, who have played this huge role in my life. Okay, so let's switch a little bit to the music side, right? Um, so um, my friend Kathy Takayama, who many of you know from the ISOTL world, um, had given this talk, and um, and she talked about you know thinking about ways in which we can get deep engagement in the discipline, right? Um, uh, and what does that mean? And so um, as as we think about you know different ways of teaching and different ways of engaging our students and different ways of understanding how our students are learning, um, this became a a nice framework, I guess I should say, in terms of thinking about how um, I, um, the first time I really sort of became instructor of record and started to think about teaching physics, uh, teaching music, really teaching music at this university level, what did that mean? But I think the, the deep engagement in the discipline for physics is also important because, um, you know, uh, physics, for instance, has so few people who voluntarily sort of go into it that we're always thinking about are there ways in which 
when we teach physics, right, do we attract people to the discipline, right? Um, there are some people who come to college, especially in the United States at the various institutions I've been at, who for, you know, some, they're, they're weird people like I did, you know, in seventh grade, I knew that I wanted to get a PhD in physics and went on to get one, but that's not everybody's reaction, right? So how do we, how do we get a, an engagement in the discipline in such a way that even in our introductory courses, we can show people the beauty of the uh, subject, the beauty of the discipline in such a way that they will want to um, actually become uh, students of it further. So, um, the, the portal of engagement that I had, um, another phrase I borrowed from, um, uh, first heard from Kathy, uh, the portal of engagement I had was this idea about teaching a world music ensemble class, right? And um, I have told people that when I was first approached to do this, um, I told that department, the music department, I said, look, I don't know what world music is, right? This is, the world music is a phraseology that you Western people have come up with, right? So I don't know world music. I know only one kind of music, right? One kind of sort of ethnic music and that's sort of North Indian classical. So I can teach a class in that, but I cannot do sort of the survey of, um, you know, world musics that typically uh, some of these classes have done in the past, whereas I could do that in physics, right? So in, in the, a survey of physical science or a survey of physics class, it is an established tradition. Um, where we typically do a little bit of mechanics, a little bit of heat, a little bit of electricity magnetism, a little bit of possibly space science, so on and so forth. That's that's a traditional um, makeup of a, a survey class in physics, but I was I was not willing to kind of engage in that, and I had did not have the background. So those of you who um, know how universities work, right, um, and I, I am imagining it's very similar in Canada and the UK um, as it is in the US, that if you don't have degrees right, in a particular um, area, it's very difficult to get an appointment on the faculty in those areas, right? So this is probably my greatest academic accomplishment ever is with absolutely no formal degrees from you know, accredited institutions recognized by the West um, that I've actually been able to have um, you know, uh, music department faculty appointments at not just one, but three different universities. So I'll get into a little bit more about that. So, um, so this the the really formal part of this right goes back to two thousand and seven, um, and in the last um, you know decade and a half or so, there's only about three or four semesters that have actually missed teaching this either through uh, some kind of a formal setting, right? But I've always been in institutions that you know were not in places like New York City or Boston or Chicago or Toronto or Vancouver where there's there is where there's a huge presence in terms of um, people and culture um, related to ethnic music. So I've been at been at smaller institutions where just kind of the geography and just the student population have not had much of a presence in terms of um, ethnic ethnic musicologies in general. Right. Um, these are performance ensembles, and I'll get into a little, that a little bit more. The enrollment in these ensembles over the years has started has been as, as little as six and gone up to like 20 or so, right, which is a lot for an ensemble. Um, and then what's also been interesting and a huge contrast from the way I've taught physics is that these ensembles are multi-generational in that, you know, I've had undergraduates in them, I've had graduate students in them, um, I've had faculty, right, staff, and community members, right? So um, typically the classes have been taught with uh, both a community option where people can sort of sign up through the extended learning uh, division of the university, as well as um, uh, undergraduate students or graduate students taking it for academic credit. Um, and there's been, you know, it's one of those classes where some people never graduate, they just keep coming back for more and more and more. And that's the beauty of an ensemble and the ways, way in most US universities, the way it's set up that you can repeat um, the same course multiple times uh, with slightly different uh, uh, credit bearing course numbers. But um, I've had students um, who've taken it, you know, six or seven times and actually gotten, cre gotten credit for it um, for multiple semesters, which is once again very different from what happens in physics, where most of the time, um, if you see a student and they're repeating the class, it's not because it was a positive outcome, right? Whereas in music, it's just the opposite. It's because it was a positive outcome, people come back for more. Right? We almost never want to see our uh, repeat students in, in classes like physics. So I'm going to come back to this, this individual with the initial JH, but um, 
as I first got into sort of teaching, this is the 2000, 2007, 2008 time period, really starting to think about, you know, what does the World Music Ensemble class represent, right? And then what are the elements, uh, what are the technical elements of that? And then what are the other sort of cultural and creative elements of that? And so um, JH, who I shall name later, was a, was a huge uh, piece in my, my developing my understanding of what I was doing with this class. So the first time I, I was asked to teach this, right, uh, what pedagogy should I use, right? I was a very active learning oriented um, physics teacher already. I used clickers, I used video technologies, right? Um, and so, you know, there is this old adage out there, we teach the way we were taught, right? So would it work, right? Well, um, it's a little bit different because, you know, people don't play physics in quite the same way that you play music, right? You have lab experiences to some degree, but it isn't necessarily, especially in teaching introductory physics, is, is much less of an active type of um, endeavor than is a music class, right? But at the same time, there are these formalisms that have to be taught because if you're getting into Indian classical music, there is a formal language to describe it, right? And so just like in physics as a formal language, uh, the language of mathematics very often, Newton's laws, right? To describe a certain phenomena um, in classical music, there's also the same kind of um, barrier that had to be crossed to teach students the, the music. So, you know, um, would my physics pedagogy work in music? Um, I couldn't change who I was, right? And so there were going to be certain aspects of my own personality and teaching that I would definitely bring to the table, but then would I be able to teach, create some kind of new hybrid pedagogy? And here's those of you who remember clickers from back in the day, right before there were apps and phones to do that. It's one of the clickers that I used to use. So um, with that clicker segue, let me just talk briefly about um, uh, the role of technology in teaching music. Right, and here's another blast from the past. Some of you on here may be old enough to remember HyperCard, right? HyperCard was a thing, right? And HyperCard was um, a technology through which I actually designed my very first music instructional um, uh, deck, right? And um, and in that, in those the late 80s, early 90s, it was um, something where I started to think about how do I formalize and take things out of books, right? And then add the aspect of both the visual, the audio, right? So recording some music, putting into something a hypercard deck and let people understand a little bit about Indian music. And so that was some nice support I had at UCLA to be able to do that. Um, you can read some of these other items, but um, you know, the uh, YouTube, has actually been been huge in the last uh, decade, especially as YouTube has grown in terms of both my own learning and as well as the dissemination. And finally, of course, just especially post pandemic, I now have some uh, students who attend my class via Zoom. And they're close enough to actually, a couple of them to actually be able to um, uh, perform with us uh, for, a, for a final performance. They can make the drive. So um, the, a lot of the literature that I had read in terms of teaching physics had this whole idea about, you know, the tabula rasa, right? Do I actually have a blank slate to write on? And the first time I was teaching um, did, in fact, I have some opportunity because students didn't have a background in Indian classical music. Uh, could I have some, some opportunity to be able to really, you know, set, set the tone, right? Or were there misconceptions, just like in teaching physics, there are misconceptions to overcome. So this is just a, a screenshot of one of my first boards and really coming up with, okay, writing it in sort of the English al Roman alphabet, right? Some of the, the notations. So Sarigama Padhanisa is the Indian version of Doremi Fasolati, right? And so um, how do you making that matching and then coming up with ways to represent the sounds and um, the various melodies of Indian music was something that I've developed over the years. Just point out a couple of things here, right? I mentioned already the thing about um, uh, under the instructor, you know, how do how do I get in there and be um, a formal instructor with uh, the appropriate um, regional accreditation uh, credentials? 
but then also um, there was no there was no infrastructure. So in all the three places, the university had absolutely no instruments, right? But one thing I was good at was I was I was good at writing grant proposals for my own science work and and uh, funding my own research in science education. So I was able to bring those skills to bear. And uh, where there was some money available was to be able to write some some internal grants uh, to be able to get some money to be able to get some instruments right. So that was huge. And then, of course, connecting with the community was huge. So early on, we were able to borrow some instruments from the community. And as I tell people, you know, um, in an ensemble, uh, everybody comes with one free instrument right? Your God-given instrument is the voice, right? And so at least you can get started in terms of um, learning the material through the use of your voice. One huge drawback for me as an instructor was the fact that I had no knowledge of or very, very limited knowledge of Western classical music. I didn't really know staff notation very well to be able to do it. But then, of course, a lot of students don't necessarily know uh, staff notation either. And so coming up with a sort of unique and adaptable notation style that would be accessible to all was another outcome of, of sort of the music pedagogy. Right? How do you get students to sign up? Well, many ensembles have auditions. I was very much focused on open enrollment, right? And then also because of just geographically where we are, it was very limited access, especially when I was starting out to sort of Indian culture, heritage, language, right? A slumdog millionaire hadn't come out yet, right? So people hadn't really heard about some of this stuff that have, that now made um, you know uh, Indian music in many many forms much more accessible to people. And then this last bullet point, competence and expertise, right? Um, there was some serious concern that I had, which uh, was, okay, so how, you know, how do I define competence, right? What is going to be the outcome of, of this teaching in music, right? Who's going to evaluate my teaching, uh, evaluate my teaching? And then how do the students know that what they're getting from me is actually sort of an authentic experience, right? So there was a little bit of imposter syndrome, but then there was also this thinking about, hmm, you know, um, how is the department, so thinking about from an organizational point of view, how is the music department actually going to determine whether or not I'm going to give a, a doing a good job because there wasn't much expertise uh, related to this in any of the departments that I've been in. If you think about assessment, right? Um, that was a huge shift as well, because now the assessment of learning, right, which is a, which is a place that you could do it, it doesn't come through quizzes, you know, tests or even presentations or group work. It really comes through performance. So who was going to actually, you know, assess the le the level of assessment, right? And then finally, the measures of success, right? Um, and you know, I've I think currently I've I've been when I've been teaching, I've been sort of the university-based expert in teaching this in a radius of, you know, 50 or 100 miles even, right? And so um, it's never happened when I've taught physics. I've always, I've had other colleagues who are physicists who are, you know, knew the subject just as deeply as I did, right? Uh, but in this ethnic music ensemble, you're sort of on your own, right? So, um, so then you have to, of course, depend on the ethnic community participation to some degree, but then also, uh, this is what's emerged very much lately, is the larger community and social media has, has played a big role in all of that. Just recently, as I was preparing for this uh, for this presentation, um, I came across this the blog, the Teaching Teachers Going Greatless blog. Okay, and there were elements to this that, that kind of struck me. So I just want to present this and have you take a look at it. So educator identity, right? My educator identity as an Asian male you know, PhD physicist was definitely a mainstream, pretty privileged kind of place to be, right? But my educator identity as a ethnomusicologist, right, was a little bit more suspect, right? I didn't know what it was going to be, right? Uh, would there be higher scrutiny, right? Would uh, this be accepted? What kind of skepticism would I face, right? I don't think it was dangerous for me, right? But it was definitely a, a, an interesting area. And so um, I'll kind of sum up this, this aspect to kind of realize at some point that, hey, if they just ignored me and let me do my thing, that was okay, right? That was going to be good enough in terms of um, navigating all of this, right? Is that great? Does that really help you build some of some sense of, of colleagues and, and community? No, but it's definitely better 
than being, um, you know, uh, scrutinized in sort of negative ways. I want to jump briefly and just talk about um, some of the, the the sort of the actual practical aspects of of the teaching, right? So back when I was a, a grad student, um, a very famous musician, Prabha Atre, came to UCLA, and I got actually a chance to first to sort of firsthand see what this kind of a um, ensemble could kind of look like. Okay, so here's kind of a layout. That's the instructor, the lady wearing the sari, the white sari in the middle, right? She was. Um, uh, she, she visited us for a couple of months and we had a concert, right? Here is my very first sort of formal um, ensemble uh, presentation, right? Jumping ahead here a couple 20 years to fall 2007. And then let me actually move ahead with this one. Okay, so moving ahead to then um, Auburn University, fall 2014, about seven, seven more years ahead. Okay, similar kind of layout. You see, see me in the middle, right? Um, lot, lots of student musicians there. And then finally, just very recently, just from fall 2022, right? Um, slightly different setting, doesn't look like a formal um, uh, concert hall, but then um, the same kind of layout, right? And I just want to say something just in terms of the, the progression in different institutions that currently most of my students are in fact adults. Most of my students are actually of sort of South Asian origin. Uh, many of them are faculty at the university. And so it's been a very a, a different way to approach the teaching because many of them sort of come with cultural knowledge um, and their own sort of, you know, conceptions about what the music should sound like and what it should be like versus um, opportunities where I was the expert um, in the class itself. So it's been a very different sort of collaborative atmosphere in terms of um, putting that music together. Um, I mentioned that, you know, I've looked to the community for validation. So back in 2009, so uh, this was from the 2007 concert, I had actually done a screenshot, right? This particular um, composition uh, was online and it had 6.8K views, right? Uh, the great thing about YouTube, YouTube has really been my archive in that regard where I've been able to sort of store the concert videos over, over the decades, right? And here we are, just took a screenshot uh, last week, right? And it's that, that same piece is still up there. It's only up to 24K views, right? Um, because there's a lot more people on YouTube nowadays uh, with probably versions of this very same uh, Raga Bharat Bhairab that we did, but it's still there and it's, you know, it's definitely continues to garner some views over the years, right? So uh, thinking about YouTube as an archive and uh, how, to, how to sort of mine that archive is definitely one of my sort of scholarship goals uh, in the future. I have a whole... Um, channel with lots and lots of concert videos that you can go check out. It's pretty easy to find. Um, and even though I've left Auburn, the Auburn Sangeet name is so big now that I haven't actually changed that name. So just in terms of how I've been thinking about, you know, um, you know, what's been um, my impact and how am I in fact teaching these students, um, you know, uh, material that's going to resonate with, with other people and is in fact authentic learning going on here. So here's one composition, Rag Vilakamod, the composition is called Nida Bharana Kaise Jaun. And um, this particular, uh, this particular song, um, it was, you know, like many of the pieces now, I've been teaching myself first, right, before uh, then teaching the students. It's about 11 minute videos, so the whole composition. Um, and and there's been, you know, that's 22K views. It's not our most viewed. It's not our least viewed. Uh, and about 94 comments, which one of, once again is sort of the middle of the middle of the pack in terms of the comments that we've gotten on this. It's been up for about seven or eight years. And I think what's interesting is that um, the kinds of comments we've gotten, mostly coming from India, first of all, right? These, this, these uh, materials being sought out by people in India over uh, most other places, it has been um, over, overwhelmingly positive but sort of very light, right? It's sort of, it's a like, it's at the like level. Um, I've it's put this thing as many people have made comments like, oh, it's so good to see foreigners singing our Indian music, right? Because especially with those Auburn videos, a lot of um, uh, people not of Indian origin um, in them doing it. And then also bringing back nostalgia for, for some, of the, some of the viewers. Um, and then actually enjoying the fact that this was a pretty famous composition. And the fact that we were trying to replicate it was, was appreciated. But, but not so much in terms of critical comments on musicality, right? And I think the sort of trained ethnomusicologists probably ignore me or 
Um, you know, I don't know if they think that I have much value to add in this particular area, right? Because I'm definitely not trained as an ethnomusicologist, but I've definitely, I think, made an impact just in terms of thinking about the way that this has, uh, this music has evolved. Okay, so I'd mentioned this word joy, and I, and I want to spend sort of the last five minutes or so kind of talking about uh, joy and words that probably, Neil, you're like, hey, actors and scripts, this is stuff right up my alley. So what's, what's all this about, right? So um, I'm going to talk about the joy of teaching physics briefly, and really an active learning approach to teaching physics, and in this particular case as one um, particular thing that uh, people who teach physics are very familiar with, interactive lecture demonstrations is an active learning way that has a, a long history within the physics teaching community, right? I borrowed the language of actor scripts and orchestration from the CSCL community. CSCL is computer supported collaborative learning, especially big in Europe. So Pierre Dillenborg's group out of Lausanne, uh, Yanis Dimitriadis' group out of Valladolid in Spain um, have done some groundbreaking work uh, on this, and I've had an opportunity to collaborate with them in terms of teaching um, science and the computer-supported part of it. But really, the idea is that whenever you're doing active learning, right, there are actors, right? There's actors, there's people involved, there's resource allocation that has to happen, right, when you're doing an active learning thing in a classroom. There's a script, right? All uh, successful active learnings have, have a script, you know, what happens when and who does what in what order. And then there's the orchestration, right? And this is where the, the, the teaching part comes in. How do you enact the script, right? Um, because in a active learning classroom, there's like multi-layered activities going on. There's multiple stuff going on. So, so this was really gave me some language to talk about um, active learning and, and to really think about the joy. So this is a complicated diagram, which really takes the um, that particular interactive lecture demonstration. So the eight steps on the right hand side, that's the script. This is how you go about doing an interactive lecture demonstration, very explicit, right? This comes from Dylan Borg's work, right? And then, right, um, you have these different levels of actors. And so I posit that the presence of the joy comes about because the, the focus of the activity changes. There's some whole class activity, there's pair group activity, there's individual student activity, the faculty members walking around, interacting with these different groups at different times, and the dashed lines, right? The dashed lines were connecting um, through the, the time period of the activity, the dashed lines that are connecting the different groups that's where the possibility lies to sort of explore and discover joy happening, right? So um, I, I've, I've written a small paper about this, but um, in coming back to thinking about, you know, where does one get, pick up on that joy? If it was just, you know, even the most beautifully developed lecture, there wouldn't be that, that opportunity to engage with students in a way that would give you that joy. So in, in an ensemble performance, where then is the the uh, the breakdown in terms of the the scripts and the orchestration, right? So, um, uh, you know, the actors, of course, are students and teachers. There's resource allocation thing. You'll notice clothing, right? So throughout my time, especially when I was dealing primarily with undergraduates who didn't have clothing, um, the students. Um, I had to actually, for the males, and then I'd worked on finding stuff for the females, actually give them some sort of ethnic wear so that in terms of final performances, that would be something that they could feel comfortable with. Right. The script. The script became important because the first time I did this, right, um, I was really concerned about, okay, how does one you know, set out um, an entire program because my very first charge back in 2007, the department said, okay, the department had said, okay, the expectation is that every ensemble puts on a hour long recital at the end. And I just remember thinking to myself, how in the world am I gonna do that, right? And so thinking about how do you, how do you pay stuff, right? And then also what's the appropriate progression? And so I read about that in, in books that I had um, and then came up with the fact that we would wanna move um, and here's one example of, of a program from one of our recent performances, right, move from uh, sort of heavier material, right, more classical, Sanskrit text-based, right, uh, deeper in meaning, to number nine at the bottom here is a very famous folk song. It's a folksy song. Uh, we've done it with dance performances and really bringing a whole different level of, um, you know, uh, mood to the, to, 
the, the particular performance, right? So this progression is something that I had to work through, which was definitely something that's uh, endemic to the, the a true ensemble performance, but something I'd never really thought about before I had to teach it myself. So I wanna give a couple of quick examples here as well. And one is about making thinking visible, right? So this was a huge um, thread in my thinking about my teaching of physics. And um, some my students surprised me by doing something. So watch the hands of the students as as we as I play this clip. In the chat, if you know what tal, what rhythmic pattern this is, you can type that into the into the chat as well. So I'll stop it there, right? And you, you notice that the students were essentially doing a clap and a wave to demonstrate the particular rhythmic pattern that we were in. Okay. Here's what, what was would be surprising to me. I had not taught them this particular rhythmic pattern, and I had not taught them actually explicitly to do that, right? But they had become sort of um, really accustomed in class when I probably had, I had rehearsed this with them. And the, what they had picked up on was that part of the tradition was in fact, right, to show the rhythmic pattern through these claps and wave combinations in order to, you know, demonstrate your understanding, your participation in the field, right, your participation in the piece. And spontaneously, when I started this, I still remember this, you know, um, uh, this many years later, uh, this, the, the young lady who's just immediately to my next, she started, right, showing, doing this visible demonstration of the, of the rhythmic, rhythmic pattern, right, and then everybody else in the class picked up on it and started going, right. So here was this rare opportunity for me to see that my students had learned, right, and there was an assessment opportunity, not something that I personally had orchestrated, but in fact that the, the learning had sort of seeped in at the level as in which they were able to be full participants in the field. Okay, so I'm going to just finish up with this very, the two items on here from that same, um, from that same blog, and it's talking about students becoming evangelizers for pedagogy when you have a more progressive uh, pedagogy and students then uh, as a result um, fostering joy and curiosity. I'm not sure how marginalized my students were in this particular case, but those two really popped out. And the reason I say that is because um, with the, uh, the the music class, right, um, at the ensembles, especially at when I've had primarily had undergraduate students, they have really become evangelizers for just the, the presence of the, of the ensemble and being able to recruit other people to, into it, right? Um, there, were, there were obviously learning barriers, but once they overcome it, they became evangelizers. And so that was really great to see. And then finally, um, the, the last result about you know, fostering joy. I wanted to, wanted to bring to you the fact that joy can be fostered. And um, I'm gonna share one other kind of uh, clip with you in just a second to just kind of show uh, what that joy looked like. And in the meantime, just as we get ready, if there's any questions, perhaps Neil, we can tape a couple of questions in the chat and I, I'm gonna uh, stop sharing this screen and share another screen to just kind of show where joy came about. Okay, do you guys see the screen with a guy with a hat making funny? We got it. Super. Okay, that thing does not happen in a physics class, right? So this is a pretty well-known um, Indian budget. And so those kinds of indicators, right? <laughs> It's little, it's trivial, right? But the fact that students felt, right, this is our, this is basically the, the final exam versus the final recital at the end of the semester, right? And when, when, when students are enjoying, right, participating in the process that much, right, that they can get up on stage and actually at the right point in, in, in the whole uh, piece, just kind of, you know, uh, motion, 
motioned to each other across, like basically across the stage. That to me was, was one of these beautiful pieces about how students stayed engaged and uh, were deeply immersed in the learning. And I'm gonna stop there, Neil, just so we have a few minutes for questions. Um, had a lot more to say, but I think that's a great place to stop. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, if you have a question, you're welcome to put it in the chat, or if you'd like care to put your hand up and uh, turn on your microphone or your camera uh, and and ask it that way, uh, we can also run it there. But I do want to start by saying that you asked for folks to guess uh, what the rhythmic pattern was. Ashwani guessed Damar, and Na has guessed Rupak, uh, and I'm on tenterhooks to know the the truth. <laughs> so in this particular case, it was Rupak, right? But Dhamar right. is also a 14 beat tal, so it's possible that we could work Dhamar into it, but definitely it was uh, Rupak. We were, we were going for Rupak, yes. And Ashwini has hand raised. Oh, hi, uh, uh, Dr. Raj Chaudhary. It was such a uh, wonderful experience to listen to your talk. Generally, I'm not the first one to, to raise my hand to ask a question or make a comment, but in this case, I, I thought I would do that. So just want to give you a little bit of background. I don't have a question, but I do want to uh, share that when I uh, when I saw this uh, uh, information about this talk came, I was very excited because of my own passion for Indian classical music. And I also uh, uh, teach kids here. I have been learning myself. So I was really happy to see that there is somebody who has uh, not exactly the same path, but quite a similar path. And the, the questions that you, the, the comments that you made about uh, imposter syndrome and all that, you know, I, uh, my, me and my wife, the other person who guessed Rupert is my wife, Neha Acharya. So we play music together. We both are professors. Uh, I teach at Mount St. Vincent University here in Halifax, and she teaches at Dalhousie. And we teach uh, music to young children. And hopefully, uh, my hope is that we will also create an ensemble for uh, adult people soon. So overall, it was uh, such a wonderful thing to learn about your experiences and uh, the critical reflections that you have shared, uh, especially uh, you know invoking autobiographical and autoethnographic uh, kind of a thinking, which I uh, I write a lot about uh, uh, autobiographically uh, autobiographically about my teaching and also music. So I'm going to reach out to you uh, at some point and 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 uh, and hopefully you can give me some some advice on how I can. Uh, proceed further but so wonderful to 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 have thank you, you. thank you and yes you so um yeah let's collaborate on something okay I'll, I'll look forward to hearing from you thank you wonderful thank you wonderful if i don't know if there are any other questions but i certainly have one which is the maple league for those of you who don't know is uh, an umbrella organization um uh, between four small universities and so we are we're in quite small towns um and university towns where there often isn't kind of breadth and depth of experience. So if there are faculty or even staff on the call who, who feel like they have something to offer the university, but don't quite know the path forward, do you have any thoughts for a first step or, or a place to start conversations to bring that in? Right, so I think um, the, um... You know, my particular path is kind of a little bit strange and, and it's worked at Auburn and at South Alabama because I teach the class for free, right? So I think that's definitely one of the things that I'm able to do. So people said, okay, we'll let you do it because you you know teach it for free. At Christopher Newman was part of my teaching load, right? And then it became something that I just wanted to do. So, um, so I have the luxury of being able to do that. I think one great way to, to get engaged is a lot of people have might have a world religion class, right? Or a Hinduism class. They might have international studies classes, right? And uh, the faculty who teach those kinds of classes typically are looking to bring diverse experiences to their students, right? So mm -hmm. you might be a faculty in another, in a, or, or professor in another faculty. You might be a community member, and maybe there's ways in which to come in and just do sort of maybe a guest lecture demo, right? That can right. or. or you know, music appreciation classes often are looking for people to come in and, and then sort of gauge experiences that way and to see can, will, they, will there be some stickiness there where something would take and people would be able to um, go further with it. Thank you so much. That's a great thought. I see I see your hand, N.A. Um, I don't know if you'd like to step and ask the next question. Hi, yeah, I'm Neha. Um... I, I just had a, I, first of all, I really enjoyed the, the talk as well, it was wonderful. I just had a question about um, one element that I think unites physics and music among the many that do, and, and that is um, that, you know, both of them have elements of formula in a sense that are in and of themselves 
very beautiful. Um, mm. But then both fields also have this kind of tremendous scope for creativity and innovation and improvisation, which is like very particular, I suppose, to, to Indian music. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how, how you go about teaching creativity, um, because that's something Correct. that I, I have struggled with in terms of learning myself. Like, I feel like I, I get stuck <laughs> with in terms of becoming creative and also trying to teach my, my own students. Like I teach in a law school, so <clears throat> often we ignore creativity, but in some of my classes, um, we do try to bring it in, but I've also found it, found it difficult. So I wondered for your comments. Sure. So I think in terms of creativity on, let's say, the, you know, the, the, the traditional discipline sides, right, law, physics, whatever it might be, their um, um, case-based scenarios, right, or case studies, or, I mean, of course, you do case studies in law, right, but thinking about, you know, alternative scenarios where um, you, um, you provide the student the opportunity for input. I'll give you an example from physics. Design a sport to play on the moon. So great one that I give, right? We, right. So on the moon, you have sort of similar kind of stuff going on, but there's other kind of factors. So you could take mm -hmm. something very simple, right? Like uh, you know, playing tennis or something, and like what what does that become, right? On something like the moon, even you have a pressurized dome, and so now that allows the students to grapple with that same problem, demonstrate their knowledge of the basic physics, but in this sort of alternative environment. Right? In the music's case, um, what we've done. Um, it all sort of depends on the, the students in a particular uh, semester, but so we have, we script the improvisations, right? So as a group, we will say that, okay, here's a particular rag. Okay, we are going to create these thons, right? And then students have broken up into small groups and they've composed thons, right? And then we all listen to the thons and the ones that we all like and seem to really fit, then we work those into the composition and then everybody learns those thons, right? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately when we're doing a group performance, uh, we can't have I've not gotten to the point where people so can just solo go off and do their own thons, but we've learned them together. So it's been the creative piece, and then that's been worked into the overall um, uh, performance. So that's one way I've done creativity of Indian music that way. That's great. Thank, Thank you. What a great question. And we have time for just one more, I think. And Douglas, uh, would you like to ask our final question? Just get to I'm a doctor, uh, doctor of philosophy. Okay, and I thought it was pretty good. Okay, what I was looking at though is combining for a lot um, of physics with music, if you if you can be together to to make a sound or so, uh, is you know um, using physics with music. Is there any way of doing? It? Has anyone ever tried that? So Douglas, what I the, what a class that I actually have taught in the past and and is, is called the physics of music or the science of sound. So there mm -hmm. are classes like that that we can teach at at the um, you know at the undergraduate level. I've taught that um, where in fact you are looking at the physical principles between sound generation, right? The physical principles of sound um, absorption, hearing, the design of certain instruments, all of that. Yes, there there are courses that do that. Um, in my particular case, um, the um, engagement in the music, I've just kept it as, as two separate realms. But yeah, absolutely, physics of music or science of sound are, are pretty well-known courses, and, and I'd love to teach one again someday. Great, thank you. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We've got a tiny bit over the hour.